Good afternoon. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Shabazz Lam. I lead one of the professional services teams based out of the New York office. Um, I'm joined here by Mari Sajjpour from professional services and Pete Marney from uh, John Wiley and Son. Uh, today we're going to talk about how you can enable DevOps um, in an enterprise using AWS Service Catalog. So throughout this session, we really want to talk through a handful of things. One is we want to just lay down the foundations of cloud, we want to lay down the foundations for cloud formation, as well as AWS Service Catalog. We want to be able to explain to you some best practices, and then uh, Peter will come up and talk about how John Wiley and Son was able to accelerate into AWS and how you may be able to utilize the same patterns for your own companies. So just a few tidbits of cloud formation just so that we are all on the same page. Right. Oops, our slides are not up. Oh. Sorry. Can we get the So just a few tidbits on uh, AWS CloudFormation. So for a CloudFormation, you start off by creating a template. A template is written in JSON or YAML. Um, through that, you're going to define certain parameters. You're going to create certain resources which relate to AWS services. And you can define configuration actions which dictate what those uh, resources can or cannot do. Um, once, you just, once you finish creating your template, you go ahead and create a framework. Um, and that CloudFormation framework really goes ahead and you know, calls what we call, creates what we call a stack. And the stack is really where all of the resources are collected together, and then they result in, in an artifact that can be deployed and utilized. Okay. And so the benefits of CloudFormation are that you can get version control, you have an automated way of deploying AWS resources, you can have it seamlessly integrate with your CI CD pipeline, um, in, in tandem with any configuration management tool that you may have, and you can get all of this at no additional cost. So when you look through it in terms of a, a pure infrastructure as code, and you look out through the workflow, right? you create the code, you're defining some versions, you go ahead and you have code reviews internally, you go ahead and push it towards an integration system, and then you go ahead and deploy. Now if you take this a little bit further, right? so as you're doing your code, you go ahead and utilize the text editor. The text editor then goes ahead and you can use your source repository like Git or SVN or Subversion to go ahead and, and version control. And then that will allow you to use your review tools to validate what you've created. And then that will push you forward into deploying AWS services. I mean, in the end, it's really all just software. So as you, as you go through this, the next piece of mind is to think about you know, how do you really deploy your assets, right? And how do you really think about what the landscape is going to be? The key pieces of here are you really want to define something, have it approved once by the powers that be, and then be able to make it reusable. And then once it's reusable, then you can go ahead and use it over and over and over again, and be able to have different teams leverage what one team has created. Right? And then you also want to enable self-service. So as your teams are able to utilize these services, you want them to be able to stand on their own two feet and not necessarily keep going back to the teams that initially created. So if you want to put this all together, AWS has released um, a, a, a AWS Service Catalog. The whole point of Service Catalog is to be able to build and manage approved templates and to be able to control how they can be accessed and deployed. So you know, the key piece is, right, you want to be able to, on one side, allow for standardization and governance, but then also not impact the agility and speed that your product teams and development teams want to have in order to advance. So you know, before we move forward, I want to make sure we're on the same page in terms of some key terms. So the first thing you will hear in terms of service catalog is a product. A product is basically an IT service that you want to make available for deployment on AWS. This is essentially EC2, S3, right? any one of the AWS services or resources that we allow. Next is a portfolio. A portfolio is a collection of products. Right? And you can go ahead and you can define configuration information within it. Next is a constraint. 
we're going to be talking about two types of constraints. Um, so constraints are, a, are the ability for you to specify how resources can be deployed. Right? And finally is a stack. So once you put a service catalog together with a product and, and into a portfolio of products, you go ahead and you initiate a CloudFormation template, which essentially creates a stack that we referenced earlier. So the key point around service catalog to understand is that it allows you to really move forward really fast. So it, allows, it enables you, right? So we have the ability to access 11 different user APIs. And as of November of this year, you can do 37 admin APIs, right? And you can share these products across multiple portfolios, across multiple accounts. Right? In addition, right, we allow you to version control. So if you decide that you want to create V2 of a product or V3 of a product, but for some reason one of your teams uh, is not able to utilize the latest version for whatever reason, you're able to allow them to use V2 and, and control V3 separately. It allows you to limit console access, and at the end, you, know, you can limit or add in constraints as to how you want to launch, um, as well as how you want people to be able to control and define parameters. So if you're really trying to put this all together, right, you can have your automation team that can go ahead and create a template. That template goes ahead and pushes through and, and it gets aggregated together to create products, and those products can be deployed onto AWS. You have an administrator who then takes these products and then creates separate portfolios and, and assigns these product portfolios to different teams. And, and with that, it can define constraints as to what portfolios can be deployed, what can have console access, and where, and where it's necessary to add tags. And then that can go ahead and be pushed forward onto the different teams and the different portfolio groups, and then you can add this related to users or roles and such. So where this really comes in handy is that you have products on one side and you have administrators on the other, and you're able to allow them to work in tandem with each other. Now, once an administrator creates a product and deploys it, you can, you can become a little bit more advanced and then be able to at least use some microservices on the back end to be able to use certain things like Lambda to be able to generate additional tasks once the product gets deployed. So instead of initiating and writing all of those, all of those triggers and functions in the beginning, you can have them happen at the end and standardize on the products first. Right? So when you look at it from the, the end consumer or the end user standpoint, right, the end user will go ahead and try to browse a catalog of products. These products will go ahead and be versioned and be allowed to have different configuration patterns depending on the users and roles assigned to the end user. And so once they go ahead and and go ahead and deploy a product, the stack gets created. That stack then sends a notification back out to the end user. In addition, you can go ahead and take that stack and create a notification out to the administrator that a certain stack was deployed. So once that stack actually gets deployed, that administrator can take additional actions and create scheduled functions. So for example, if, a, if an application gets deployed via a stack, an administrator can have a Lambda function that goes ahead and touches a Route 53 table and to update it to be able to make sure that that application is accessible. So, you know, when you think about this from an enterprise standpoint, service catalog really allows you the ability to control and govern your environment. Um, put in granular controls and around versioning, around users, around provisioning, and at the same time, you know, allow for reliability and allow for automation to come through. And you, know, you can go ahead and utilize the API, you can utilize the AWS CLI, you can force tags and maintain that balance of consistency while not hampering progress. So now I'd like to invite Pete Marnio to talk about how John Wiley and Sons use Service Catalog. Great, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Pete Marnie. I look after um, product development, content management, and content strategy at Wiley. First, a special thanks to Shabazz, Mahdi, and AWS. Um, we've, Wiley has worked, the team at Wiley has worked really hard on our cloud strategy over the past year, and being invited to speak at reInvent is a really nice affirmation for the hard work and accomplishment of the team, um, many of which are, several of which are here with me today. Before we get to our cloud journey, I'll tell you a little bit more about who we are. Wiley is a global company that helps people and organizations develop the skills and knowledge they need to succeed. 
We publish online scientific, technical, and medical journals, as well as offer, offer digital learning, assessment, and certification solutions. Today, about 50% of our revenue comes from peer-reviewed scholarly research. Each year, we publish about 12 Nobel laureates, more than 500 in our history. And we used to publish Herman Melville, Washington Irving, and other great writers. But today, we also publish leading authors in management, leadership, architecture, and so on. And actually, we're very proud to be the official publisher for Amazon Web Services. Online Library is our flagship product for peer-reviewed scholarly research with 15 million unique visitors a month from 25,000 institutional customers. And we publish about 2,000 new books a year with over 20,000 in our backlist. And Wiley Plus is our online higher education product with 500,000 students from 1,100 colleges and universities each year. Notwithstanding these great products, you may know us better for this, the For Dummies brand. I thought it was very interesting yesterday in Andy's keynote when he spoke about immortality and he talked about how since the, Fortune 5, since the first Fortune 500 list came out in the 1950s, only 12% of those companies survive today. Um, and, and it was an interesting contrast for Wiley, which was founded in 1807. And 209 years is kind of hard to get your head around, so I'll give you a couple of uh, factoids to ground that. When Wiley was founded, Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States and there was only 17 states in the Union. And you'd have to wait five more years before Napoleon began his famous march through Russia. We're a global uh, company that is family controlled, seven generations in the Wiley family, professionally managed, and publicly traded on New York Stock Exchange. Of our nearly 5,000 employees, 525 are in product development, and 300 are in IT. Each year, we generate about $1.8 in revenue, and almost two-thirds of that comes from digital products. So let's get back to our cloud journey. When I came, back to, when I came to Wiley three years ago, it was to define and execute a digital-first content strategy. And by that, what we mean is creating digital-first publishing pathways that can allow us to unlock the intelligence that's bound inside of a book or locked inside of a PDF. We also want to enable our authors to work in a modern envi environment, and we want to present content to our customers in such a way that it integrates with how they do their jobs. Simply said, we want to transform a static two-dimensional page into dynamic, intelligent content. But this led to an interesting progression for us. Given our long history in publishing, our workflows and applications we're very siloed and print focused. Before we could have a digital first publishing strategy, we needed to establish a technology foundation. We needed to move away from monolithic, purpose-built, rigid systems, and instead architect a coherent platform that would not only catch us up technologically, but allow us to stay at the forefront of new and emerging technologies. We needed a platform that would iterate and grow with a rapidly evolving publishing landscape. So we had a great strategy, but there were challenges in execution. Namely, our on-prem infrastructure ecosystem was not going to support our ambitions. We needed to deploy infrastructure and procure software quickly. But we were moving at a glacial pace. So we were not going to real realize the scale, agility, and speed from on-prem. So we needed to move to the cloud quickly. So we embarked on a campaign to educate Wiley why we, why we needed to be cloud first. And this part was really important for us. We talked to anybody and everybody about the benefits of AWS, from the board of directors through to employees at town halls. Um, it was not just a product development decision. We needed executives, business owners, product managers to support us. And the folks at AWS were terrific partners in this. Um, because they really helped to educate us about AWS, they introduced us to reference clients, and they, gave, they helped us a lot with initial architect, architecture decisions. I should point out, it was not just the challenges with on-prem, but also the benefits of AWS. Namely, 
giving us a cost-effective, secure environment and enabling, very easily enabling global deployments. Many of our products, like Wiley Plus for higher education, have seasonal peaks and troughs. Um, very high demand at the beginning of a semester, not so much in the summer. So we can use AWS to mirror those demands. Since we're building all of our new applications on AWS, we need to be able to provision software and products quickly, like Couchbase, Jenkins, Ansible. And we use Service Catalog to tightly govern usage, security, and compliance. In very short order, we utilize many services and capabilities on Service Catalog and AWS Marketplace. Today, we have 10 colleagues creating artifacts in Service Catalog and another 40 using it on a read-only basis. It wasn't part of our initial intention, um, but nonetheless, we did end up dramatically increasing time to market using AWS services like Lambda, RDS, Elastic Cache, Elastic Search. And since we're a large, mature enterprise, it wasn't reasonable for us to do a lift and shift our entire existing tech estate. We have some 900 applications on 5,000 VMs, and what's more, many of our applications are on hardware and operating systems that can't migrate. So we needed a, a, a hybrid cloud approach. So in our hybrid cloud approach, all of our new development is deployed on AWS. All of our customer-facing applications will move to the cloud, as well as business applications that are available in SaaS. We are selective about what legacy applications we refactor for the cloud. And an important thing to note is that our hybrid uh, environment is not segregated. Applications on AWS need to work with our on-prem applications. Our most recent deployment, which was actually just two nights ago, um, is 60% on AWS and the balance on-prem. So we knew what we wanted, but we didn't know how to do it. Enter AWS Professional Services. We wanted Wiley colleagues, as well as our IT services partner, TCS, to learn cloud computing from the experts. ProServe is, was instrumental in helping us with all of these. But in particular, the team helped us create a DevOps culture, architect a hybrid cloud ecosystem, and I can't emphasize this enough, thanks to the pro professional services team, we now have a lot of AWS experts within Wiley. We collaborated with the professional services team to articulate these requirements, and they advised us that service catalog as a foundational capability would meet all of them. And while they're all important, for me, security and repeatable experiences really stand out. So now I'm going to ask Madi to tell you how we made it all happen. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Madi. I'm from the AWS Professional Services team, and I had the pleasure of working with Wiley for the past year uh, to get them up and running on AWS. When I started working with them, they had a few accounts and in AWS, and each account was kind of associated with an application or a team that was trying to test things out on AWS, but they already started their journey and they were looking at moving a marquee application to AWS. And when I, I got tasked with, let's make a wily wide environment, just one environment where we can bring all the applications in and, and leverage that environment and also have on-prem integration. So we want to have a single account to do this. We want to have consistency and integration with the on-prem environment. As Peter just mentioned, 60% of the application is going to sit in AWS, 40% is going to sit on-prem. Well, that brings up a lot of challenges where you, know, you want to make sure you have that connectivity, but also from an operational perspective, you want to have a lot of consistency in terms of what you're doing. So you want to have the same kind of images, you want to have the uh, same processes in place, and at, at the end of the day, though, you don't want to have the same kind of process in terms of time in terms of how long it takes to get a resource. So let's say on-prem it takes a few days to get a resource. In AWS, it shouldn't take you two or three days to get a resource because you need to go through all of these processes. So at the end of the day, we wanted to increase the agility of the development environment and the developers and give them, enable them with the power to be able to launch resources and take it from there. So taking all, those, taking all that into consideration, we decided to pick Service Catalog, and here's why we picked Service Catalog as a solution to enable the developers and also meet all the security and operational requirements. So I'll start off with standardization. So there was a bunch, there was a lot of discussion around what we're going to use to standardize artifacts in AWS. 
So as most of you know, CloudFormation is one, of, one way of standardizing or having a consistent environment within AWS. We had a lot of discussions. We decided to standardize on <coughs> using CloudFormation. So CloudFormation is the benefits or I think most of you are aware of it, but one other, another benefit they had was once we release a service, I mean, it doesn't take much longer for us to actually give you CloudFormation for that service or enable CloudFormation for that particular service, if not at the same time as releasing it. So we decided to pick CloudFormation as a standardization tool. But CloudFormation by itself is, is if you were gonna give it to an organization with a few hundred developers and IT folks, how are you gonna enforce consistency across the organization, if they're going to log into the console and launch something, and how are you going to make sure they're launching in the right security groups and the right subnets, they're doing the right things, right? So you want to enforce some kind of consistency. And with using service catalog template constraints and launch constraints, you can limit the, the, what users can do down to the CloudFormation template li limit uh, level. So you can set the parameters in the CloudFormation template can be limited through service catalog so that it helps you enforce consistency. You also want to limit access. So you want to make sure that somebody who wants to log into the console, they won't be going to another region and launching something from there, or they can't be able to just launch any service that they want. So Service Catalog gives you that ability with template constraints and launch constraints, specifically launch constraints. You can limit what's being launched from a product. What about in terms of enforcing tags and security groups? So you can enforce tags, you can enforce security groups through Service Catalog. We also wanted to make it a one-stop shop. So if I was a developer, I logged in, and I wanted to launch something, I could do that from that console. If I wanted to see the CloudWatch logs for, the, for my server that I just launched, I could do it again through the console. I didn't have to go through another process to do that, right? And la <clears throat> the last two options is the automate deployments. So we wanted to make sure that they can automate their deployments so they could leverage the AWS CLI to be able to automate the deployments into production, into non-production, and build the entire app stack. And last but not least is to, to create a governance environment which is very agile. So what do you mean by that? So in Service Catalog, you're spending your time, your InfoSec people, your operations people, they're spending their time enabling services and enabling access as opposed to locking down services, right? So through launch constraints, through template constraints, you, you have a assurance that there is some level of security there. So now you can spend a lot of your time enabling services for people as opposed to locking them down. So if somebody launches in Service Catalog, let's say in US East 1, you can only limit them to US East 1 because they only have products in that particular region. So how do we go about implementing Service Catalog now that we went over why we picked Service Catalog? So let's start with the infrastructure. We build the infrastructure so it meets the application needs, an AWS best practice. So standard enterprise app has four tiers, web, app, cache, database, you know, you've seen it probably before in many of our slides. So we decided to build the infrastructure in AWS to meet the application needs. So you start with the security side and the infrastructure side. So we build the security groups to align with the application tiers. So we build these four security groups here as an example, the web, the app, the cache, and the database to align with the, with the application tiers. Next, we build the, in, the subnets in AWS to actually align with that too. So we'll have four subnets in this example that align with with the application. So now we have you know, the infrastructure set up, we have some of the security parameters set up, and now we want to actually take this and make it a consistent environment. So let's say I have a web server, I want to build it once, I want to build a CloudFormation template once and share it across multiple applications. And if other dev teams want to do it, why should I just recreate the same CloudFormation template over and over again? So let's see how we went about it. <clears throat> so we created CloudFormation templates on a per tier basis. There's a few benefits there. I'll go over. One of them is, well, you're only creating it here and you can reuse it anywhere you want, but also think about it from a cleanup perspective. So if I'm a developer, I launch a web server, I launch an app server, and I just want to test something out and I want to take it down, you're not taking down the whole stack, you're just taking that component down, or if you're trying to refresh it, you can refresh it back. So from there, we created service catalog products specific to each tier. So in this particular example, there's four service catalog products that were built. One for a web server, app server, cache, and database. So we put that into a portfolio, a service catalog portfolio. So we have one service catalog portfolio specific to let's say application A at this point. What do we do in terms of access? If you, if you, looked at, if you remember Peter mentioned that you wanted to have per application separation, so you wanna make sure if I'm a developer, I log in, I'm working on five projects, 
I, I limit my blast radius to, to a specific project that I'm on, as opposed to going to multiple projects and affecting things, right? So the portfolio now aligns to the application. So you have one portfolio that's assigned to a particular application. What does that mean in terms of access? I can have an IEM role that maps to that portfolio and service catalog. So I'm creating an alignment between my IEM role and the application from a service catalog point of view. So the portfolio, the people who have port access to the portfolio are in this specific IEM group, or IEM role, sorry. And then IEM role maps to an active directory group if you have SSO integration or federation. So what do we see here? We see two kinds of alignments. One is a tier alignment, which if you see from the app tier I highlighted there. So you have the security group, the subnet, the CloudFormation template, and the, the uh, product from service catalog, they're all aligned to each other. And from an access point of view, you have everything aligned. So your AD group aligns with your application, aligns with your service catalog portfolio, and so that way you can limit people in that sense. In, for the access alignment, we did an additional level of separation. So if I'm a developer, I log in, I should have a different kind of access than, let's say, the automation people. If the admins log in, they should have a different level of access. So we created, like, for example, in this case, three kinds of AD groups. An AD group by application, so the application, so it would be, let's say, application A, then application A-developers, A-operations, A-automation. You know, in terms of the tiers, what you see here is we, we created a single tier, so it's very easy and reusable. So let's just review what I just mentioned here. So we designed the app infrastructure to meet the application following AWS best practices. We did security and separation on three levels, application level, application tier level, and function and access level. And you make sure your security and your, and your network is aligned with your application design. So now let's talk about how we deployed applications. And I think this is a critical part of any, any organization wants to launch an application. They're like, oh, how do we launch a, a full stack in, of, of an application in AWS? So let's start with this example here. Let's say we have nothing in terms of infrastructure. No servers, no nothing. And we want to get to a state at the top, which is a fully deployed application. So we define it into three different stages. Again, another AWS best practice. <clears throat> so infrastructure as code, manage the infrastructure as code through service catalog, through CloudFormation. You can lock it down from, from a template perspective to a specific AMI, to a specific security group, to a specific, specific subnet, and have CloudFormation launch from there. The next stage is the environmental configuration, or what we refer to as config management. Well, you have a config management layer. So in terms of Wiley, they picked Ansible and CloudFormation user data to kind of build the environment. And last but not least is the application deployment piece, which was Jenkins that they used for deploying an application through Jenkins. Now, how does it work in terms of an organization? Because this is all great, but how does it map into like what the roles and responsibilities are? And I'll get into that in, in a minute. But let's say there's three teams that we work with. So the operations team were kind of responsible for defining what the infrastructure as code part looks for. The development team were kind of managing the upper part of the stack. We had an automation and release management team, which were kind of actually building the artifacts, but they're also kind of focused heavily on the environmental configuration part, but they had a role to play in the whole thing. So let's review what it looks like in terms of a developer experience. So I'm a developer, I want to log in, I want to launch. Remember, I want to reduce the time to value for a developer, right? So I have an idea, I want to test it out. I want to see how quickly I can test that idea out, right? So that's idea to value time. You want to minimize that as much as you can so you can leverage whatever value is coming as soon as possible. So I look at it as two, two things, right? We look at it as two things. There's a single product launch, which we talked about, like a web server, an app server. I want to test something out. So think of this as your innovation use case. I want to innovate something. I want to create a new product. How do I do that? Well, I just launch something. I can launch it easily. And from there, I'm good, right? What about an application stack? That's an entire application. I want to do a stress test on an entire application. How do I do a stress test on an entire application? Well, I have to launch the entire application, which was the app de deployment model that I just presented to you. So think of that in terms of operational excellence. I want to test a bug. I want to stress test something. I could do it like that. So this is how the experience looks like currently for a developer. So I'm a developer. I log into the AWS console. I go to server's catalog. From server's catalog, I'll get a bunch of products. I'll pick the product that I want. Let's say I pick a web server. 
The web server has template constraints limiting me to specific security groups that I'm going to launch in. It's going to limit me in terms of the AMI that I can pick. So the AMI that I'm picking is exactly the same AMI that's on-prem, for example, in Wiley. They have the same exact image. So you have consistency in terms of environment. And think about how the operations team is going to manage this. So if you have a dev team, sorry, if you have a Unix team or a Windows team, and they want to actually troubleshoot something, they don't have to do something different. They have the same experience. So you're kind of enforcing it through server's catalog. And you're enforcing security in a proactive way. So you're not waiting for resources to start for you to go and check. You're actually taking steps to check for security in advance. So nobody can actually launch something without it falling into the right piece of the puzzle, right? So think of your network as a big puzzle and you're making sure that you're actually dropping each server in the right location. So the web server launches in the back, a CloudFormation template kicks off that the user does not have access to any of these resources. So I'm a developer, I only have access to service catalog and I can only launch a product. And when I launch the product, I don't have access to EC2 or launching EC2. So you're limiting them in that terms. So that creates an EC2 instance, let's say a web server. And now in the background, we're talking about operations from an enterprise perspective, you kick off CloudWatch events. What does CloudWatch events do? It takes care of all the additional processes that you need to take care of let's say from an ITSM point of view, let's say you want to add it to DNS. So you, for example, in the case of Wiley, we're using Lambda to add entries into DNS through tagging. And again, through service dialog, we're enforcing tagging so people can change their tags. We're also giving them developers access to the specific machines that they have through tags. And what we're doing in terms of other ITSM processes is they don't have integration, for example, with their, their CMB, CMDB doesn't have integration with AWS. So what they're doing instead is they're sending emails out to their appropriate groups and trying to automate as much of the process as you can. So if you look at it from an operations point of view and from an IT perspective, you have a bunch of processes that you need to run no matter what if you're in an enterprise, right? There's a lot of it is security, a lot of it is governance, and a lot of it is just regular operations and monitoring and stuff like that. So you're pushing all the security stuff to the beginning and you're making it very preventive using service catalog and all of the other operations which can come afterwards, but they're also as necessary for you as an enterprise are happening in an automated fashion or after the resource is created. So this reduces the time for a developer to actually access a resource and start building or testing or, or troubleshooting a bug. So you're reducing your time to value and you're increasing your agility and you're also increasing your reusability. So you create the CloudFormation template once and then you're done. This is a workflow in the non-production environment. And last but not least, I remember I mentioned how they can leverage CloudWatch uh, uh, to see what's going on. So they can actually log into the console, they could open a support ticket or they can uh, uh, look at their logs to see what's going on with their server. What about an entire app stack? Same kind of concept, but now you're using the AWS, CLI, AWS Service Catalog CLI. So we're using Jenkins. Jenkins kicks off multiple CLI calls to Service Catalog, which is, let's say, an entire stack. So web server, app server database, for example, that kicks off a bunch of CloudFormation templates. Those CloudFormation templates build the infrastructure, and then you call Ansible to build the environment. And then once the environment is built, then the application gets deployed through Jenkins. Again, this is a non-production workflow. Uh, but it, it works pretty well. So you see everything is automated. I want to test something out. I have a bug. I want to test that bug out. This is a good way of doing it. So let's take a look, quick look at what's happening with the CLI and how you can build the CLI from, from scratch to be able to do exactly what we just talked about. So I'm going to go through the steps uh, fairly quickly is how, how, the, how you build that CLI command to launch a product. So you search for products. You use AWS Service Catalog search products. It will list you all your products you get the product ID, which is specific to each product. You take that product and you get the list of the versions for that particular product, and you can also get the list of launch paths. So the launch paths specify the tags, the, uh, the constraints that are specific to it. The next thing you do is you, do a provision, you list the provisioning parameters. So if you have a CloudFormation template, it has multiple parameters. This will kind of list you what the parameters are that you need to specify from a service catalog point of view. So once you have all this information, you can actually write a one-liner, and this is a fairly complicated one. You can even make it much simpler than this, that launches you know, a resource in AWS. So you can take this and put it into Jenkins and have Jenkins launch it or any of your orchestrators. If you notice here, I am actually using the, uh, the, the, the parameters that are being supplied on the command line. 
Now, if you have a lot of parameters, and for example, in the Wiley's case, they're not actually using the command line to supply all the parameters, it's a JSON file that they're providing to, to the command line. So let's look, take a look at what the production rollout experience looks like. So let's say we tested everything in non-prod, everything looks great. Now we want to promote this build to production. Same concept, so but it's just different teams who are going to deploy it. So let's say that the release management team wants to deploy this template. They finalize it, it's the service catalog template with CloudFormation. Now they're ready to go, the product's ready to go, the artifacts are in the artifact library, everything's ready to go. <clears throat> they, they finalize the template, this CloudFormation template, and now they can either share it with another account, so you can share resources with another account, and if you make things, and if you build everything where, where there's easy application portability between non-prod and prod, it's very easy to do it. You just have to change the security group, the subnet, everything, is, everything else stays the same. So if you just keep the same parameters across that are different, then it's very easy to, to import it into another account. In the case of Wiley, what's happening is the operations team is actually looking at the template and verifying that they're actually following all the requirements from, you know, from an operations security point of view, and they're importing it. So now we're going to automate the deployment. And we decide to automate the deployment from the non-production environment. The, the, the EC2 where Jenkins is sitting on has a cross-account role which can launch products on the production account. And that machine is locked down to specific people who can actually launch it. The benefit here is you only have one Jenkins machine, you only have one artifact library, and that artifact repository is, doesn't have to get synced, so there's less things to break. So Jenkins makes a call through the CLI to the production account. The production account kicks off the CloudFormation template, Ansible gets picked off, and Jenkins from non-production is actually building the, the application and everything is done. So you have one Jenkins, one artifact repository, you don't need to sync, everything works great. So now let's look at the numbers in terms of what's the impact, what's the agility in terms of what Wiley's been able to do. So Wiley has just over 10 service catalog portfolios. They have a little bit over 50 service catalog products, but they've been able to launch over 800 service catalog products in just the last three months. And they've also terminated more than 500 of them. That just shows you the agility that they were able to get, right? So easy bring up, easy take down, and you're done with your environment and, and you're building it. So giving developers the agility that they need from, from, from to launch it. So let's talk about what, what that means in terms of, let's say, or the organizational side of it. So how do we accomplish this? It's a large organization, hundreds of people in IT, 5,000 employees, so how does this apply to you in terms of, you know, in terms of how to make this happen from an organizational point of view? So as I mentioned, when we started, Wiley had a few people who would use Service Catalog, a few people who were learning, sorry, a few people who would use CloudFormation, a few people who were on, service, uh, on AWS, they were just beginning on their journey towards it. So we look at users from three, we look at, in AWS we look at users from, from, three, from an angle of three kind of personas. So there's consumers, people who consume resources in AWS. There are people who create artifacts. So let's say they create CloudFormation templates. And there's people who manage the environment. So think of this. I know you're immediately thinking consumers are developers, but it might not necessarily be developers. It might be your auditing team. It might be your InfoSec team. It might be your Unix team that doesn't really need to manage the AWS environment, but they need to log in and see what's going on in this particular server. So the consumers are mainly focused on leveraging the environment and taking, getting the benefits from the resources. The managers are more concerned about making sure they meet InfoSec requirements, they meet operational requirements, they're responsible for managing the environment. So think InfoSec, a lot of the operations team. In this particular case, we, we were working directly with TCS, one of our partners, and they were kind of manning a cloud engineering team which was kind of managing the environment and helping integrate with us. And the creators are the people who kind of create these artifacts. So in a typical organization, you would think about release management, automation team, some people call them DevOps team. They kind of manage that, that environment. They're the people who want to create. But we didn't limit, it, limit this to specifically to like this particular group or this particular job function. We kind of looked for people who wanted to learn AWS, people who wanted to learn CloudFormation. They wanted to get involved. And we got a bunch of people from different parts of the organization to kind of get involved. So the creators were <clears throat> the folks from architecture team, from the automation team, there's people from the operations team. It's just about what they wanted to do in AWS. The next thing we did was, okay, well now we have this. We have a bunch of operational requirements we need to meet, and this is what the developers want to do. So let's start some interactions between the two of them. Let's have them talk to each other and figure out what the requirements are, define those requirements, and get them, get them working. So we built a wiki. The wiki had two parts. It made it very simple for a developer to log in to find out what they needed to do to launch in AWS what the requirements were, 
what they had to do and launch from there. There was an infrastructure part which explained to an infrastructure person, this is what you need to do. This is how I'm a sec network security person. I log in. I need to do a specific thing in AWS. I, I don't know the AWS platform. This is what you do. So we created all these FAQs, made it very easy. And it's a global company. So if you create a repository where it's easy for people to see what's going on, then you don't need to wait for emails or exchanges over, the, over, over, the, over 24 hours to be able to know what's going on. So we, within the case of Wiley, they had teams in Russia, in the UK, in India, in New Jersey, all over the globe, right? So they were able to, to go to a single repository to find out how the environment requirements work. So with, from a wiki perspective, they could actually subscribe to those wiki pages which had the environment requirements in, and every time there was a change, they would get an email, for example. We also leveraged Git for the CloudFormation templates. So we put all the CloudFormation templates in Git, and we took that version we we're actually moving the process of taking that version and using it as the same thing as a service catalog version. So you can tell that this particular version is this CloudFormation template. It's nice and easy to follow. So here's a summary of what I mentioned. Uh, so what we did from, from a consumer perspective, just think in terms of governance, operations, how you want to run in an enterprise. The governance responsibility for a consumer that uses service catalog is minimal. They just need to make sure they're not actually you know, creating a lot of costs, launching a lot of products. And I'll add, you, add a little tidbit there. We actually limited developers in terms of the instance types they could launch. So if they want to test something out, they could just launch a T2. They don't need to have access to I2s or R servers. So they had limited access, and you could do that through, through template constraints. And how does, what, what does the creators do? The creators create artifacts. So they're creating CloudFormation templates. They're building on that environment. And the managers, they're, they're building, uh, they're making sure that the environment is compliant with, the, with what on-prem. So once this cycle starts, gradually the trust increases. You have people in the middle who learn more about AWS, and the trust between the managers and the creators increases, so they, don't, they can actually start giving them more and more access. And from a service catalog point of view, they actually map, these three users map to, to, to manage policies that we provide to you. So the consumers can be end user full access users. You can also have people who have only read only access that can't do anything in service catalog but look at it. The creators become admin full access people from a service catalog uh, managed policy point of view. And then the managers are folks who have that and they have the IEM full access. So they're the ones creating the policies. So here's an example of what it looks like, for example, for, for Wiley. Active Directory group maps to the IEM role, and these are the policies that, for example, are attached. The ones that are highlighted in orange are managed policies that we used, so it's very easy to create, give users access to it. Uh, here's a few benefits just to point out. So if I'm a developer, I hit a bug, let's say on a console, I hit a bug somewhere else, I want to open a support ticket, I want to find something out, I could just open a support ticket. I don't need to go through loops to be able to do that. It makes it nice and easy for them. If they want to look at the logs, they can log in and look at the logs, they can't run anything, in terms of launching resources directly from the service. They have to go through service catalog for everything. What about the creators? The creators now can do, for example, things like CloudFront. That's a managed service. It's not really managed. It's not an, an, an infrastructure that you manage on-prem. It's a service that you're managing. So there's a lot of guardrails around it. And once the trust increases, you can let them create the CloudFormation distributions. You can let them update the CloudFormation distribution, among other things that you can do. So you're building an environment that's gradually you, you, they're, they're gradually learning more and more about how to use the environment. And the administrators have full admin access. So here's what it looks like from a process point of view. So the operations folks, or the InfoSec people, they create the Active Directory groups, they create the IEM roles, they create the IEM policies, they have full control over the environment, they create the launch constraints within Service Catalog. What does that mean? That means that when, some, when a template wants to launch, they'll define what the constraints are. So this is a time where they have to focus, OK, well, we're going to make sure this is limited to this specific thing. They define what the template constraints are. So what, what's the army we're going to use? What's the security group we're going to use? What's the subnet, the instance type, the tags that are, the, are there? So they don't actually implement that part of it. They're actually focusing on defining what those are. So make it nice and easy for them. What do the release management automation folks do? They're the one creating the, the portfolios, the products, and they're ma making sure that they, they're actually implementing the template constraints in the environment. So they're actually building the template constraints and adding them to the products to make sure that the developers can actually launch things quickly. 
So here's an example. We just released the admin API a couple of weeks ago. Uh, now you can actually automate the way you create your constraints. So let's say from a service catalog point of view, I want to limit people to two armies. This is an example of limiting somebody to two specific armies on a template. So before this, you couldn't do this. You had to do it manually. You had to go through the console and do it. Now you can do it through the, through the API. What that means, let's, let's see what, what the implications of that are. So let's say I have a new army. We released it from the AWS Marketplace. We, you subscribe to the SNS topic for Windows or Amazon Linux. We send an SNS message out. So you can build a Lambda function that creates your new army. And I've seen enterprises already do that. You can also have that same Lambda function or a similar Lambda function create and update your new army constraints and enforce them. So you're moving your security to a preventive model. So that means that your operations people are now, they know that the rest is sure that the right army is launched with the right security constraints in it, and you can do other, other, all the other stuff too, security groups, subnets, et cetera, et cetera. So in conclusion, let's just review what we talked about. So we created alignments between the different tiers or services we have. So let's say from a security perspective, access perspective, we created a tier. Uh, and we aligned those tiers together. So you had your Active Directory group, your IEM role, your service catalog portfolio, they all aligned with each other. Same thing with your infrastructure. Your infrastructure, your VPC, subnets mapped to your, service, to your security groups to the application tier. So that gives you that opportunity to align. So once you have alignment, you can create consistency. So how do you create consistency? You use it's cloud formation to create consistency or repeatable experience. It's going to be difficult to use cloud formation alone to enforce governance or create reusability because whoever is going to take that cloud formation template has to do a lot, of, a lot of work to be able to actually reuse it or needs to know the infrastructure and we want to take that away from the, from the developers. We don't want them to worry about the, the infrastructure, what's going on down there. We want them to be just worried about launching the application and being able to, to leverage it. So use service catalog to create your reusability. So you can easily reuse the CloudFormation templates that you just created. So once you have reusability, then you can make your environment much, much more agile and they can actually launch things quickly, test things out, fail quickly if there's something wrong, and be successful quickly if something is right. So it gives you the agility and flexibility that your organization wants or your development team needs. And in turn, hopefully that will learn to a faster time to market, more automation, and built-in governance. So you're moving a lot of the processes out of the way and making things much faster. And hopefully that will lead to, to your organization taking off. And with that, I'll pass it to Peter for some final remarks. Thanks, Marty. So when I look back at how far we've come in the past year, I'm really compelled to think of Wiley as perhaps the first 200-year-old startup. Um, and I really have to give a big shout out to Mahdi because there's absolutely no way we would have accomplished as much as we have in the past year without all of his expertise and help. So you're a star. Thank you. Um, in the past year, we completely adopted a cloud first strategy, built a significant portion of our digital first publishing platform from scratch, launched a strategically important application for our authors. That's the one that just went live two days ago and upscaled and increased engagement with many of our technology colleagues. And what's more, Service Catalog allowed us to embrace a DevOps culture at Wiley. So what I'd like to do, whoop, just a quick video, a vision, a vision piece for us.
with that, we'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, the three of us will be around to, for you to ask any questions if you have after the session. Um, and please remember to complete your evaluations. Thank you, everyone.